Uh, good evening, everyone. I say uh, so. Doctor, I'll introduce you uh, yeah. to Dr. Rick Singleton, who is retired. I think he's worked harder now than ever. An active volunteer with several organizations, including the Gathering Place, in the NL Health Accord, NUA. His career included six years as Provost and Vice Chancellor of Queen's College, Faculty of Theology in St. John's, and he was nearly 30 years as Director of Pastoral Care and Ethics within the Newfoundland and Labrador Health Care System. He was educated at Memorial University, University of Western Ontario, Graduate Theological Foundation, Indiana Foundation House, Oxford. He holds certification in grief counseling and health services management. He holds a PhD in health ethics and a doctoral ministry degree, but especially in grief and bereavement counseling. He is an adjunct uh, professor of theology, philosophy in the Faculty of Arts and adjunct professor in the Community Health and Humanities Division. Faculty of Medicine at the Moore University. He's author of the resource program used at sites across Newfoundland and in other provinces. He has well over 40 years experience in pastoral care and theological education. So when we, were, we formed our transition team for the Centre City Parish here, we thought that this would be a very good idea because we knew that Dr. Rick had already done that in some other parts of our guide, Archdiocese. So we invite him to this session to provide opportunity for reflection and discussion on some theoretical and practical considerations for those adjusting to the significant changes that are coming about in parishes, the archdiocese, and the broader church and society. Dr. Rick Singleton will lead the session for us this evening, and we already have discussed his academic credentials and experience as a grief counselor, pastoral theologian, Healthcare essence. This session will also be recorded and available for other people after we put that on some sites in our, our, our parish website and other places. So, without further ado, I welcome Dr. Rick Singleton. Great. Thank you, uh, Father Cecil, and uh, it's uh, good to be here. I ask our technician to uh, say a few words about how to. People can ask questions, make comments, and uh, be part of the be part of the, the bit of discussion that we might be able to. Uh, yeah. So uh, this evening, uh, if you have a question or need uh, some clarification, uh, simply put it in the chat window. Uh, there's also an option to raise your hand, uh, and I'll be monitoring it throughout the, the discussion. Good. And here in the room, we're delighted uh, when if people have questions or comments uh, to pitch in as well. So uh, the title of the session, as it says on your screen, as you can see in front of you, the faces and phases of grief in times of change. Uh, this is a presentation that I kind of that has grown out of substantial bit of experience, things that I've learned from dealing with people who have to face significant changes in their lives. Some of them changes by choice, but a lot of change by circumstance. A lot of my work, of course, was in the area of bereavement, which is kind of specifically grief around the loss of a, a loved one, usually through death. But grief happens in all kinds of ways, all kinds of circumstances. And that's part of what we'll peel back in a little while to kind of uh, uh, apply some, of, as uh, Father Cecil said, theoretical uh, matters that we know about grief and practical things and apply it to this context of the significant changes that are happening, certainly in these parishes, throughout the archdiocese, throughout the church generally, and broader culture and society as well. And that's all relevant to what people are dealing with and how they deal with it. So we'll take a few minutes uh, tonight to focus on some key, so key concepts of grief. We'll mix in a little bit of time for some discussion, hopefully a little bit of uh, spiritual alignment, I might call it. What's the root of this? Well, how the, do these types of things give meaning in our lives, sometimes shatter meaning, and then how do we uh, make meaning or allow for new meaning to come about, and uh, then probably glimpse a bit to the future uh, of what we might do to kind of uh, forge ahead in our own efforts to continue to be faithful, we might say. 
I thought a good way to start this is to use a, a tribute that was written to uh, St. Oscar Romero, he is now. It was written in 1979, he died uh, in 1980. Actually, he was shot at the consecration of the mass, the mass at a cancer hospital in San Salvador. But he was shot because he was resisting and leading a movement against the immense corruption that was happening in uh, El Salvador and naturally those gangs and uh, uh, the uh, cartels and what have you that were uh, being, uh, you might say, disturbed by him uh, got uh, to the point where they decided to have him done away with. But this tribute to him was written by a fellow bishop, but I think it's beautiful to inspire any of us and all of us to look at what are we doing and why do we do what we do and how do we keep going when the things we aspire to aren't happening right away and they aren't going to happen overnight and in fact they might never happen in our own lives in our lifetimes but why should we continue on and this uh, tribute by Oscar Romero is says or to Oscar Romero says, it helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. That is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between a master builder and a worker. We are the workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Let's give you a moment to ponder this. Ponder that and allow to inspire a confidence to as it says, do something, even though we know we can't do anything, we can't do everything, but we can do something and it will make a difference. The tribute to Oscar Romero that I just read made reference to uh, the building of the kingdom of God. And the focus that I'm taking in this session is really a lens of grief on the significant changes that people are dealing with, mostly by circumstances that have come about. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we move along. But one of the things worth bearing in mind is that grief is a normal experience when things come about in our lives that we don't want to have happen. And St. Paul in the early church, when he was addressing the concern that his followers had about 
uh, about whether or not they should even grieve. Is there something wrong with them because they were grieving when loved ones died? And Paul Morla said to them, yes, you will grieve. Sure, you will grieve. He would say it's normal and natural and healthy to grieve, but he says, let us not grieve as those who have no hope. Some translations say, let us not grieve as those who have no faith. The distinction that St. Paul was making, the point he was making, I think that's applicable to us here is that when things are happening to us that we don't want to have happen, yes, we will be heartbroken. Yes, we will be sad. Yes, we will be tormented. But we shouldn't embrace it as if we had no faith. We don't embrace these things and move on as if there is no God and as if we aren't commissioned to work towards the building of the kingdom of God. So grief is, in that very rooted early church example that we have, St. Paul, grief is part of how we deal with things. A few definitions that I'll use just to bring out a few important points. The first one is from a textbook I used in many courses I taught on grief and bereavement, but that one, this is a classic all our uh, losses, all our grief by Mitchell and Anderson. But they give a description of grief that says, grief is the normal but bewildering cluster of ordinary human emotions arising in response to a significant loss, intensified and complicated by the relationship that a person or object lost. That's kind of a mouthful, that definition, but I'm not going to, to, to beat it to death. But what, what I do want to point out is that word normal, and if you just glimpse down and then I run through other descriptions of grief, most of them will include the word normal or natural or healthy or some such term. But what is interesting and insightful about that first definition is they describe it as normal but bewildering cluster of ordinary human emotions. And that actually, I could say, is really the acid test of whether or not someone is grieving, that they just aren't able to describe how they feel about something. See, normally we process life one feeling at a time. If I were to stop the clock with you or with anyone that I'm dealing with at any time, or you could do the same and say, what are you feeling right now? Pretty well everyone would use one feeling word for it. Most would say something such as they're happy or they are sad or they're lonely or they are uh, guilty or they are resentful or they are, if really honest with me, bored or whatever. You use a, a, a feeling word to describe what you're feeling right now. Angry. I am angry. Angry is a dominant one at this time. And we'll roll into the discussion on the fact as we move through. But when significant things happen in our lives, so much is jolted, so much is torn, that you just can't process it one feeling at a time. There are several or many feelings stirred all at once. And that's why people would say, I you know, saw many, many uh, grieving people, people in acute grief in my uh, clinical practice in, in grief counseling. And when people would come to the office, whether it was their first visit or along the way in our, in our sessions, when I would ask them, how are you feeling? Or how are you today? Something simple like that, more as a greeting than anything else. But most times the grieving person would say something such as, I don't know how I am. I'm a wreck. I'm a mess. I am no how. But sometimes they just, just shrug because they didn't have a word to describe what they were feeling. That is, we might say, the hallmark of intense grief that you find it really hard to give a full description. And what actually does help us to make progress with it is to start to pull it apart and at least identify one or two or three what we, we might call dominant feelings in that state of bewilderment. You just named one there, anger. So actually as a grief counselor, what you typically do 
in trying to help a person to kind of get into their grief, we might say, to be able to move into to where these strong feelings coming from is to say to them, well, in the way you're feeling these days, are you feeling any anger or guilt, sadness, loneliness, joy, relief, resentment? Throw out three or four or five kind of ordinary human emotions. <clears throat> and usually you won't have to list many before a person starts to nod or grunt or something to indicate, yes, there's a bit of that, and a bit of that, and a bit of that. And then we try to pick it, pull it apart one piece at a time. But sometimes the intensity and the complexity of the loss actually leads people to continue to be bewildered and overwhelmed by, by the loss because uh, it is in such a magnitude. Like one of the benefits of asking people what the, you know, naming the ordinary human emotions that they're having, getting them to identify it is that for most people, once they realize that the state they're in is made up of a mixture of several or many emotions, but once they realize that there is anger there or guilt or whatever, then they're on familiar turf. You say, no, how they've dealt with anger in their lives in the past and what works, what doesn't work, what makes it better, what makes it worse and that kind of stuff. So you're kind of getting on familiar turf. But sometimes the circumstances are so different and so intense that I've had sadness before, or I've had guilt before, I've had resentment before, but never in this magnitude. And so then that takes a bit of extra work to pick it apart and to try and move to, you know, what are going to be the coping mechanisms, we might say, that we would use, what can be the supports that we might use, what needs to be the adjustments that we make internally and beyond ourselves to be able to move on with this. So that's a kind of a, a bit of a lengthy description on that one, but a, I think an important one. And I, I don't want to totally ignore the fact that it points out that it's in response to a significant loss intensified and complicated by the relationship to the person or object lost. And I think that explains why so often in this whole matter that people are going through in the church today, especially in the church in Newfoundland and parishes where they're having uh, their churches uh, being sold and all kinds of unfortunate things coming about that it's kind of what happens sometimes in families when you lose a loved one and you never really realize how much you love that person, how much they meant to you and what, uh, how significant they were in your the shape of your normal life until they are gone. And again, in the circumstances by which they go and the circumstances by which these changes are coming about in the parishes in the church are contributing factors to that as well. The second definition that I have there is a simple and brief is a journey from the old normal to the new normal. And that's a simple, I think it carries a big message at this time that we need to really try to grab onto. I think it's kind of in some ways uh, related to the tribute to, uh, to say to Oscar Romero, you know, because the old normal, and we can look back either a few months, a few years, a few decades, or a few centuries to say what was the old normal. But that in itself verifies the change has always been happening. But this is one that's way off the scale from our own experience, for sure, in, in recent church history. Uh, that is up to all the things started coming out about the sexual abuse and in the in the eighties and and from then on. But in the meantime, grief is a journey from the way it used to be to the way it's going to be. But the new normal is not the journey. The new normal will be what it will be if and when things become settled. What shape that will have as parishes, as churches, as the church university. What will it be? 
It certainly won't be what it used to be, but that journey is the brief journey. But what I want to, to throw out is that right now we're at a stage where we really have opportunity and more than opportunity, we have obligation really to give shape to what that new normal will be. And that's new and different as well. Because the shape of the church hasn't been influenced by the laity uh, probably ever, <laughs> but certainly not in recent centuries. So that will be a significant change that will be a factor within the shaping of a new normal for Christians, whether they continue to participate in the life of the church and parishes and attending the churches that are available and the consolidations, or whether they choose to go about doing it in a different way that hasn't been considered to be part of being the life of the church in the past, but for those people, it might be the shape of the church that they will have. So this notion of going from the old normal to the new normal is really a call to being prophets in our own time, in some ways, as it was in tribute to Oscar Amira. Next one is pretty simple and straightforward reaction when things happen in our lives that we don't want to have happen. And this certainly, like many things in our own families and our own personal lives and what have you, are things that we don't want to have happen, but we have no choice about them we have only the option to try and embrace them, deal with them, process them, do whatever it takes. Grief is a normal, natural, healthy, and often painful response to loss, change, and transition. Again, normal, natural, healthy, and often painful in response, response to loss, change, and transition. There are no shortcuts, and there are no quick fixes to the emotional response that we have when our lives are torn up, shattered, or whatever way we want to describe that change that comes about, not by choice, but by circumstances. Something happened that we don't want to have happened. My favorite of all definitions of grief and descriptions is this one. Colonel Goldman, he says, grief is love's unwillingness to let go. Grief is love's unwillingness to let go. Nobody grieves over things they don't care about. No one grieves over people they don't care about. But people grieve when you lose something, someone that you love. That's the essence of grief. There's consolation in that many times for grieving people when they lose a loved one to be reminded that, you know, you wouldn't be feeling this way if it wasn't for love. And people find consolation in that. That's the reminder of it. What they realize as well is that you're not leaving the person behind forever, but you're integrating them to your life in a new way. They continue to be part of your life and you continue to love them and continue to feel their love in a different way than they were here with us in bodily form, day in, day out. But they're still part of our lives and it's still a love relationship. We're not used to, at least most of us aren't used to thinking of our relationship with institutions, the church or, or any other, as a love relationship. So we might call it, we might say that it's, a, it's a, a, a love relationship in the traditional sense. But when we use those words that, uh, that do correlate with love, such as attachment, such as commitment, such as significant mutual influence, those are words that describe love relationships. And for most of the faithful, we might say, that is where they are in their relationship with the church. And the church has been part of the nurturing done 
through the hands, the guidance of people we love, our parents and others, people who have offered us the, the guidance of the church, the consolation of the church, the practice of the church, the tendency to turn to the church for, for uh, a support in troubled times, difficult times, confusing times. That's how we're formed. That's who we are. And those things too were all one way and another shattered in these uh, in these significant changes that we're going through at the present time. So I think it can be helpful for us to remind ourselves that the pain that is being experienced is being experienced because of strong, significant attachment, really the loss of something in the structure and form that we love. A couple of other things that I'll race through about types of grief are anticipatory grieving is the grieving that we do before something actually happens. And in some ways, you know, this has been happening for a while, right? But in anticipating, where is it all going to end up? As all of these court cases and all of the appeals of court cases and all of the uh, disputes about compensation and all of that was rolling along for years and decades now, where is it going to wind up? And there's been a disheartment for many people a sadness that has been creeping in because something was being lost before it ever got to the point of churches being put for sale. The loss of credibility, the loss of moral authority, uh, those types of things. That's anticipatory grieving. And then it comes to the point where, wow, the ax has come down. The decisions are made. The gavel has sounded. And we are dealing with the cold, hard reality and that's consequent grief. But there are a couple of other even more significant aspects of uh, worth considering. One is uh, accumulated grief. And accumulated grief is the, uh, is the fact that every and any significant loss we have puts us on a grief journey, puts us on a journey of moving from the way life used to be to the way it's going to be when we get to that new normal. So for some people, it's not only the things that are happening in the church that's a, a part of a journey for them, but there's also the significant challenges that they have because they uh, may be having issues with, uh, with their own health or issues in their, within their own family or within relationships or child raising problems or job related problems or financial related problems. All of those kinds of things are disruptive in people's lives. So if we have several or many of these things happening all at once, it makes life more complicated. It makes things much more stressful, much more draining. And that is accumulated grief. And we need to bear that in mind as we try to support one another, listen to each other during these difficult times, because people can have several or many burdens that are carrying. This is not the only, the only uh, burden on their back uh, at this stage of life. There's also the aspect that every primary loss will bring with it some secondary losses. A simple example is a person, uh, say a, a senior couple, one of them gets sick and dies. And the obvious grief there, one would think, is the loss of your partner, your lifelong partner. That's very important significant. But it can also mean that the person, the one who, who is surviving, they don't have the means to be able to live alone or look after their house. And so they have to move, move in with someone else or move to a senior's uh, complex or what have you. So that brings a loss of independence, a loss of autonomy, a loss of the, of your local environment, both within your house and beyond it, in your neighborhood and the routines that you would have where you drop in next door for a cup of tea or a game of cards and all of those kinds of things. Those are all losses too, right? Now, at this time, when we see the life of the church changing, life of parish is changing. Wow, on the surface, you know, for somebody who's only hearing about this in the news because they're not very involved with any of it, uh, you know, yeah, that's uh, big and interesting and, and, you know, but, well, so what? You know, what's the difference in going to uh, St. Patrick's and going to the Basilica or going to 
Pius X and go to the Basilica or whatever the, the switch around might entail. But all of the committees, all of the groups, all of the activities, all of the ministries, all of the social life that existed around each of those parishes are kind of shifted and shaken and torn. And, you know, not that there aren't good things going to come about. We certainly hope and pray they will. But we have to deal with the reality that that primary loss of one's own parish, the church community, has many, many other losses within it, and uh, including a kind of a loss of identity. Earl Grohlman, a great writer in the area of grief and bereavement, is a Jewish rabbi. He describes a trauma and he emphasizes that, you know, we hear so much today about post-traumatic stress disorder that we are inclined to think that trauma is only experienced by these kind of uh, five alarm type of events where first responders are on the scene for major fires or crashes or explosions or, or uh, mass murders and what have you. Uh, and that is in fact, you know, very much related to post-traumatic stress disorder. But he likes to emphasize that in the life of an individual, in a family, in any context, a trauma is an event that shatters the things you take for granted. A trauma is an event that shatters the things you take for granted. And the, the response to that, the natural response that we all have, when something significant happens that shatters things you take for granted, is to have post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a particular significant and serious disruption, persistent disruption in a person's life, in a person's psychological equilibrium, we might say. They have these flashbacks and all those types of things, hard to get past. But everyone, that has something happen in their life, and we all have things happen in our lives that shatter things that we take for granted. When that comes about, we will have a post-traumatic stress response to it. And that I think is a way of describing what people are working through at this time in the church. And if we were just to pause for a moment to think of, since the 1980s, when these first cases of sexual abuse came about, what has been shattered in the life of Roman Catholics that they had taken for granted? What are things that they could never have imagined that would be coming about within their church, in their faith community? That is traumatizing. And it's a very slow traumatize, traumatization at that. It's so persistent, so continuous. How many of those things that have happened? Some of it we hear in generalities, in news stories. Some of it is very tearing at the core, at the heart of individuals because some of the things that have gone on happened to them. Some of it was brought about by people that they knew well, cared so much about, and can't really believe again what they had heard and that it was proven to be true. That is the shattering of things we take for granted. So I like to use that description here to make the point that for people, wherever they are and whoever they are, that are uh, tormented by the grief and loss, this wrong way, sorry about that, uh, that it is a, a traumatic experience because so much has happened, so much devastating, so many devastating things. You know, one of the ways that we are able to, 
It's kind of wild in the air now. Uh, where am I? There we are. One of the things that helps us to kind of deal with these tormenting things is to be able to share our thoughts and feelings on them. In fact, the single thing that helps people deal with, whether we call it stress or trauma or distress or grief or whatever words we'd want to use to describe these, these, these disruptions in our lives, the single thing that helps people more than anything else is having at least one other person with whom they can share what they think, share what they feel without being told what they should think and feel or what have you. And Henry Nouwen, a great spiritual writer, describes friendship this way. I think what he's describing is the need of benefit of sharing one's story, one's worries, one's torments, one's sadness. He says, when we honestly ask ourselves which persons in our lives mean the most to us, we often find that it's those who, instead of giving much advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a gentle and tender hand. The friend who can be silent with us in a moment of confusion, who can stay with us in an hour of grief and bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing, not curing, not healing, and face with us the reality of our powerlessness. That is the friend who cares. I know that in these days when people are and the look upon the things that are happening in the church and they're expressing their feelings about it, so often their feelings are expressed in anger and in torment and the temptation sometimes is to try and tell someone, you know, not to be so upset, not to be so angry, not to be so tormented or what have you. But what matters most to people and what will help them more than being told how to think or feel is being allowed, not only being allowed, but being respected in saying whatever it is that they feel they need to say about it. And to be affirmed in that I can see how you feel that way. I might feel the same right now, maybe I did feel the same. But that empathetic response to be able to acknowledge, I can see how you feel that way. And you know, when people approach you or, or, or me or anyone else, and they're so upset and what have you, you know, you're almost unnerved by it. Let's not forget that the rootedness of that is in the attachment that people have somehow or other in some form to church. As Earl Goldman says, grief is love's unwillingness to let go. And people who are upset and will say all kinds of things to articulate their upsetting or their measure of upset are doing it out of something that's deep within that has been shattered. Something deep within that has been shattered in something that they felt very connected to. That they had held at some point or other, in some form or other, in high regard. So, I love the way Henry Nolan puts this, and I think the point to it that's worth holding in mind is that why sharing one story with another is so powerful is that when we when we put it out to someone else. When we describe some, to someone else what we're feeling, we're actually describing it to ourselves. You know, strong emotions, strong negative feelings such as anger, resentment, jealousy, any strong negative emotion, it's kind of like a tea bag put into a mug of boiling water. And we can leave it there and it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's how those feelings sit within us until we start to bring them out. And that is the benefit of sharing what we feel, what we think about matters with others. 
Because in order for me to tell you how I feel about this, I have to sort it out in my own mind and select words. And in the process of telling you, I'm actually telling myself. I'm sorting it out and developing a kind of a, a logical pathway, a narrative that explains what went on and why I'm feeling the way I feel. And I might do this only once. In fact, I likely won't do it only once. I need to be able to do it again and again and again. But you know what we find is that as people tell this, their story, talk about their feeling over and over again, it isn't the same old story over and over again. But as people continue to talk about the matter that's been, that's traumatic, we might say, that's shattering in their life, Every time we tell a story, we're putting a bit of a different focus on it because we are, unbeknownst to ourselves, starting to understand it a bit better. And that's why being walking on the journey, we might say, being a companion on the journey, taking the role of friendship, as Henry Nowen calls it, is, uh, is so important, so therapeutic, so worthwhile, for anything that we're trying to deal with in our lives. And I think at this time, in like the church and in these parishes, occasions when people can get together and have a chin wag with one another is very therapeutic. It helps people to discover uh, what matters to themselves and what matters to one another and, uh, and, and what we hold in common. Folks, what we're gonna do now is just take a few moments to see if anyone here in this room or anyone online has any thoughts or ideas or questions or suggestions or anything that you want to bring uh, to the rest of the group. If you're here in the room, feel free to, to speak up, speak loud enough to be able to be heard. And if you're online, you can use the option there to raise your hand and uh, uh, then type in a question, comment, observation, anything you want to share, and it'll be uh, read to the rest of us in, uh, in a few moments. So, anyone, any thought come to your mind from what I've said or from things you've been thinking about for a long time or, or otherwise? What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? No. What are we going to do? What are we as a group going to do about it? And that is the good question. And I think that's where I think we as a group church, communities have to kind of consider what do we want for our own home? That's going to take some keen, I think, analysis of how and why things have come to be as they are, and then how do we respond in practicalities. There's different levels, of course, of which how that would be approached, whether it's at a very local moving things together to make a new parish come, uh, come to life uh, you know, that brings all hands in, or is it about the more, or the broader church in the Archdiocese, the broader church universal, there are things that people would think need to be done, as you might say. So, what do you think can be done? I don't know. No. We are in trouble. Oh, yes. Yeah. Big. Yeah. 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 And there's a lot of disappointment. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. In a lot of danger. Indeed, yeah. yeah. And I think part of what we have to be able to do, hopefully, so some of what I'll touch on before this session is over this evening, is uh, you know, how do we give meaning to the to the anger and to the disappointment and, and the misery we're in? Use that word for it. You know, how can it how can it be inspiring for us? And uh, I think that's part of the challenge, but we're not in it alone. You know, that's the, the key thing that St. Paul had in that short passage from Thessalonians, let us not approach it as if we have no faith or as if we have no hope, you know. We have to have good leadership. Leadership is essential too, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 At make, different levels too. You know? At all levels. At all levels, yeah, yeah absolutely. We can make decisions. Yeah, yeah. The right things. Yeah, yeah. And consultation is so important. You know? Uh, thanks, Father. I wonder, uh, in your view, to what extent, you know, at the moment, obviously, are we in a, a problem, or a, I'm sorry, in a process more of a problem, you know, a, 
problem has obviously arisen. But I just want to ask if uh, you think that a way through can be found through by groups like this mm. rather than something led by the clergy, no disrespect to the clergy, but read, led by the people who are in the pews, and then maybe have a, a chance to, to relate our views, our collective views, to the people who are making the decisions. Mm -hmm. So our feelings can be yeah. part of the collective decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you feel that that, that, that might be a mechanism that we could employ? Well, I think, the, you know, Pope Francis is trying to bring about a whole synodal approach, you know, and that's basically about lay, more lay involvement at critical levels of consultation and decision making. So I think that's happening, a movement in church. I don't think that is without its resistance, as many of those things are. A, the challenge in the church, you know, now the term issue is so often clericalism, which, uh, you know, has been paralyzing uh, the church. And Pope Francis, again, speaks of that problem. And, yeah. and others at every level of the church have, uh, have identified it. But, uh, uh, you know, yes, the process has to be taken seriously. And, and you know, as the old cliche goes, the thinking that gets you into a crisis won't be the thinking that will get you out of it. And we might say the ways of making decisions that get you into the problem won't be the ways of solving the problem. But, uh, you know, I, I think in local context, everyone who is involved at every level within ministry, ordained and lay people, faithful, people who only have nominal connection with the church are sad and tormented by what's happening. I think there's a lot of goodwill and a lot of good intentions will be mobilized once people have opportunity to kind of get their feet under themselves and get their bearings because life has been new with the church and you know, be shattered. You know? There's no way it's going to be the way it was. You can go Sunday after Sunday and feel the difference when you look at who's attending and who's not. And we all know people that can't believe that you know, people have just shut down on something that was so much part of their life. But they can't believe that the church <laughs> has been what it has turned out to be as they as they see it. And uh, you know, people look at this. I think one of the one of the things that's relevant to it, the way that many were catechized, all of us, kind of it was all such one package, you know, believing in God being part of the church, receiving the sacraments, the role of the priest, attending, contributing, participating, praying, sacraments, it's all part of one big package. And no, it has all been gone. shattered. Package is gone. The package is gone. And I, people so say, you, they, you know, people that I just have ordinary conversations say, I don't believe in God anymore. Yeah. You know? Because it's all been so much one package. So, so relate that to the kids. It is, it's yes. Yeah. And when we talk about the kids, like when I say that, you know, apply that kind of description of the movement from the old normal to the new normal, that has relevance. And I think it, it speaks to people who were in their 40s, maybe in 50s. And beyond that, the first of the the first of these sexual abuse cases in our province came about in I think around 1987 was the first one that was in the media or a large scale, right? And then of course there came up inquiries and things televised and just one after another and steady parade and then the complexities from courts and all of that. So you take roll it back to somebody who was born say in 1980, they were seven or eight years of age when all of that started. What is their old normal when it comes to the church? Well, all that came out long before. Yes, well, there's that problem as well, right? Well, you know, but it came out- used to know that. Right. That, yes, they, that's right, these young yeah, adults. Exactly. So when we're talking about an old normal, I mean, the, this, what am 
let's say, disgraced church is all that they have done in this church. And then we say, well, what are we going to do for the young people? Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have memories of the church that was more stable and more, where it was more ordered to it and so on. That in itself is a tremendous tragedy. Because those young people, they don't have that same foundation or attachment and regard for the church or for God, even, I suppose you could say, as a source of consolation. So uh, there are big challenges lie ahead for those who are enthused about building the kingdom of God, which is our prime goal. Any other questions? Or if I can just add to that. Um, so I guess to put away the context, I'm 32. Mm -hmm. um, and I converted in about three years ago. Um, so when I converted into the church, um, it was probably a year, year and a half before I even realized that we could lose churches, that this was hanging over our heads, etc. Um, I mean, and I, and I work in public relations. So like I knew this was happening. But to me, faith was always presented to me. And I was catechized in such a way that my relationship with Jesus, with my relationship with Jesus, the Catholic Church and the sacraments was something to me that was never set in a building. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, I guess it was the benefit of coming in at that time um, and having very good mentors. Um, and very good people who kind of led with Jesus mm -hmm. um, and led with love um, and the Bible. Yeah. Um, so I came in that way. Um, and I think one of the reasons why I'm here tonight um, is so that I can gain different perspectives. Um, because I'm one of our one of the volunteers leading the search team. Um, and as we're doing registration after this fall, we have a lot of people coming from the different parishes. Um, and because I talked to them on the phone with the registration, and they say to me, I'm coming to build community. So this has been very helpful mm -hmm. in helping me to kind of understand. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess A, thank you, and B, mm -hmm. yeah, to your point about coming in as a young person, yeah. it's yeah. been a very different yeah. experience. Yeah. And I would make a guess that you're, you went through the RCIA, mm -hmm. right? Which is such a different model of catechesis than you know most of us were from whenever we started getting religion well at home in practice, but taught to us in school. And I and also that, came in through a pandemic. Yeah. So that's um, another layer. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 We didn't anyway. learn the same way she learned. Yeah. Mm, no. We, we were we were in a totally different yeah. era. Yeah. Of coming into the church yeah. as children. Yeah. yeah. Whereas you came in as an adult. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. A, a, and as you say, in a pandemic. Yeah. And a totally different realm of what was happening yeah. in the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church. Yeah. We didn't know that. Mm. Yeah. We're in our settings. Yeah. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. Big, big difference. There's a, a book uh, I uh, recently read by uh, an author, Derek Scally, uh, about the uh, church in Ireland. And of course, very similar to the circumstances that are happening here. But uh, he talks about like how these things were able to come about in Ireland. And he said, you know, part of it is that people were the very way that we were catechized as well. And it was such part of the culture and what have you. He says it was, uh, you know, really a culture of uh, rote ritual and precepts, like it didn't have a depth of uh, personal analysis and conviction. And so it again was a package that you were a part of, but the spiritual depth probably wasn't nurtured as much. Now, I, my own observation that many, many people, most I would say, do have a spiritual depth to it. And that is part of the tragedy is that it is still shattering because no matter how deep your spirituality is, your belief in God and your commitment, the structure and the community, the very buildings themselves have all been part of it for a long time. And they hold memories and they are, uh, you know, there because of the faith of people who made great sacrifices. I've done these sessions in other smaller communities and, and, and many people will mention those uh, 
the circumstances by which you know their churches were built and they, their grandfathers or great grandfathers went and cut the logs and sawed it and hauled it and did everything you know and that's how the church got built and maintained you know in recent years they had whatever means to put a new roof on it and what have you, you know that deep personal commitment and the the faith was underlying the acts of getting the buildings there, and, but the amount of social activity as well that happened around the way from the church. So people are, there's a lot shattered indeed. Other comments or questions or anything online? Uh, we, any we are not seeing the speakers in the participant screens and the sound itself is rather muffled. Okay, I'm uh, hearing, but I didn't hear it well. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, Steve, Steve, is yeah, it? Steve saying that it's, uh, it's quiet. Uh, I guess people are maybe asking questions and the microphone is not picking it up. Okay. So maybe maybe you should repeat the question. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Steve. Yeah, we will do that. I'll, uh, if anyone here asks a question, I'll, I'll repeat their question or comment or, or reframe it to something that won't be as hard for me to comment on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, sure. Um, I'd like to go back to the point on leadership. Yeah. Leadership back in the 1980s and coming forward has not been good in his mm. archives. Mm. The writing has been on the wall for years that we were losing parishioners. We didn't have enough priests to go and administer to all the different churches that we had. We had lost revenues or losing revenues, and on top of it all, we had the sexual abuse. Mm. Yeah. Now, I understand quite well, yes, the victims have to be compensated. No question there. Mm. But this whole process, if the leadership or the hierarchy of the archdiocese does not listen to the parishioners going forward, we will be in the exact same position we are in today. We will have maybe one church mm. left in St. John's because people, yes, as you said earlier, they're angry, they're mad, they are upset. Yeah. And now we, who have been parishioners of a lot of the churches that have closed for years, now we are trying to find our way to where do we go next. Yeah. yeah. And that's the part that I am struggling yeah. with now. Yeah. I feel like I'm a lost sheep out there. Yeah, yeah. There's 100,000. Yes, there's a lot more money. So, so the keys. just to, to uh, repeat that comment uh, that, you know, the concern of leadership in the church has been significant because the, so many of the things that have come about since the 1980s have been growing problems and the decline in attendance and participation and contributions and all have, didn't all start recently. It's been merging forward and uh, you seem to feel, you know, more should have been done. And, and I mean, I think if we look at many places around the world, we see very similar things. And so your comments probably are equally applicable, uh, you know, in, in uh, the church in a more universal, certainly throughout Canada and Western Europe, these are common problems and, and other places as well. Yeah. And the United States, certainly. Thank you for the comment. And yes, it draws us, it draws us Look to at the some of the concern of what will come. This is Steve, yeah, do you have a question? You seem to be muted, Steve. Yeah. Steve, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, I think you were yeah, muted. I think. Look at some of the speakers you see on Vision TV. Look at the audiences they are getting. And the participation. What is it that they are doing that we are not? Did you get that? I know. Uh, so you say, look at the people on uh, the people presenting on Vision TV. Yeah. They have such a great, uh, you know, it's uh, yeah. people viewing and watching. Yeah. What are they doing that we're not doing? Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, what what is the church away basically going to yeah. different? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think what uh what what that points towards, Stephen, is an excellent point, is that people are hungry. They're hungry for things to give spiritual guidance in their life, to nourish their inner needs, word and community and what have you. And so we see lots of that and we see other denominations even locally that uh, take different approaches and seem to have, uh, have uh, more attendance. And there is a bit of a correlation to in how uh, the lay people participate uh, and that type of response. Uh, so I think there are big lessons to be learned, but the chief one is that people do have, uh, have spiritual needs and most want to find something that will give it meaning. And uh, I think these are the days when uh, within our church, and within Christianity generally, and organize, the, the main denominations have to start to be more creative in finding ways to reach out. A few years ago, the uh, Anglican Diocese here in St. John's had its synod, and the theme of the synod was, the church is left the building. And it was recognizing the uh, reality that they had that uh, people weren't attending but they didn't want them to feel that they were no longer part of the church at least Bishop Jeff Pedal, but not only he but the whole group Senate group within the Anglican Church they wanted it to be clear that you might not be attending but you're still part of the church you're still part of the people of God and uh, I think that uh, that kind of uh, title or theme that they had on that synod is one that uh, is applicable to all of us all of the time uh, when we think of it you know that the the most biggest impact of the church isn't within the walls of the building that's an important place and there are wonderful and important things that happen there gathering from sacraments gathering to hear the word together and to go out to live the word uh, together because we have received the same interpretation of it and the same inspiration for it and the, the grace of the sacraments and that those things are important. But it is those uh, words at the dismissal that is really the commissioning, you know, mass is ended, go and love and serve or whatever dismissal that would be used. Right? Uh, and that is I think the challenge today is to figure out how can that be done. I do think that many who have given up on attending church and uh, the like are interested in engaging in mission and ministry and in learning not only acts of service because there are a lot of community groups that will do things to serve the broader community and those are good things and they should be held in high regard but are also things that people participate in because they want it connected with the service of the Lord. And uh, they certainly do that for community groups as well. But church ministries are so important too. We see that in local things, the food banks, and the visitation ministries, in hospitals and what have you. So there's still good things happening. And I think making the efforts to recruit others into those things are important as well. Anything else before we push on a little bit further? Yes, take a couple of more. Um, my, in my opinion, because more of the biggest thing is that we have to talk about the church, is we have to talk about the church we want to send women. And women have such a small role in the church. Yeah. And I know a lot of my friends who have children, and they, they don't want to be part of the church that doesn't give women in the first place. Yeah, you know, that's a, a big factor in, well, it's been a fact, factor, the, yes, the question, the comment pertained to the 
discontent people have because of the uh, because of the restrictions on women participating in the life of the Catholic Church and not being ordained and in, in other leadership roles as well. Uh, and I think in current society and culture, that is a bigger issue to people than it was, you know, a few decades ago. And uh, you know, people are troubled by the fact that they feel that our uh, Canadian society, our the law of the land, allows things, rights for women and equalities and so on that the church denies. And so it's a, a kind of an interesting switch about that it was a time when the pursuit of the church, the moral authority of the church and the fight for justice in the eyes of people, the church was leading the way. Like most hospitals, most nursing homes and so on uh, throughout Canada, the very start of all of that stuff came about in uh, as ministries from uh, churches. And then, and that's not only in Canada, but around the world, <clears throat> caring for the poor and all those types of things. And so the church had such moral authority because of its interest in promoting what seemed to be fair and just and good and service and what have you. But now, as societies have changed one way and another, uh, people feel that so many of the, uh, uh, so many things about the church uh, and the church's laws really are restrictive on, uh, and, and, and that they are interpreted as being unjust and what have you. There's a long complex history and theology woven into that and numerous multiplicity of interpretations to it. But what you say is exactly the case. People just feel that it is not, the church is not embracing them. So as you say, 51% of the population of the church feels somewhat, or yeah, disenfranchised, yes. Yeah. And I, I know that I have this person that are younger and they said, why, why should we go to the church that, uh, you know, look at that country like Yeah, yeah. They feel like that's the way to have a church. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay, we're just going to take one more. Well, okay. No? Okay, we'll take one more then. She's Diane is giving you the, the floor. Uh, grief is synonymous to me as a woman. And right now we're a very wounded group yes. as having to nurse our wounds ourselves. Right. And when you have a wound, typically you go to a physician. And from the physician, and there's many ways to heal a wound, and it's go back home, look after yourself. But we lack the physician's presence. Yes, yeah. And we're having to do it the best way we know how. Uh, sometimes it's working, sometimes it's not. Sometimes yeah. we don't even know. Yeah. But I end the same, it's given the name right on the name. The shepherd has left the building, yeah. the physician has left the building, and we're trying desperately to heal one another and ourselves with the wound. Yes. Yes, so the comment is equating uh, grief with woundedness. I'll actually have a few comments on that very theme in a few minutes. But uh, I think your comments also about it being wounded and the state of the church, there's kind of that sense that, you know, there isn't the, as you say, you know, the physician <laughs> to go to, the spiritual physician, because the church is so crippled and those who are in the leadership roles and the ministry roles are uh, crippled as much as anyone by all that has, uh, uh, has uh, been going on and they're overburdened in numerous ways and so many personal losses to themselves that uh, yeah it really leaves people with deep spiritual wounds and other types of wounds and uh, where do we go to get the, the uh, you know, it's with one another I suspect it's also with how do we interpret what's the value of those wounds. We'll come to that in a little bit. But for now, folks, I just want to kind of leap back to uh, uh, to uh, the few themes that I have left here. One is how do we move through as we're processing grief? That's a word that's often used, you know. So the processing grief is, well, we process it by talking about these things, laying them out, thinking about them. You know, it was a simple rule in, in, in emotional 
health and well-being are a couple of simple ones. Uh, one is that the only way to get past a strong negative feeling is to focus on it. You know, to put the, the, the feeling like the tea bag in the, in the cup of boiling water, where we have to focus on our feelings. And we do that by talking about it or writing about it or whatever the case might be. That's a, a, you know, a, a, uh, an essential way to do it. We process those feelings of grief by focusing on them, talking about them. And the progression typically in the, in the process is by focusing primarily, we do this unbeknownst to ourselves. We don't have to organize ourselves to do this because it's done for us, it's normal, it's natural, it's healthy. We typically focus on the facts. What are the facts? What am I dealing with? What is the loss? What has happened? Why did it happen? All those questions. You know, and in this case, man or man, more facts than, you know, any person can figure out. In fact, where are you going to start? <laughs> where are you going to start? You start the top. You gotta, yeah, well, you got to start a long ways back, you know, the whole structure, all that kind of stuff, you know. Wow. You know, where to start? So the facts, but there is a point at which we know that there are enough facts that. I need to be able, my feelings are bubbling out of me because of the amount of facts that I have. And that's the shift that happens, you know, if, uh, in, 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 as people are processing their grief, they shift from all the facts and trying to get answers to the questions and what have you to eventually focusing on the feelings that are coming from those. The sadness, the anger, the upset, the disappointment, the rejection, the loss, all these words. They all are similar, but they all have their own uh, kind of bit of cloud in them. And then eventually, thank God, we start to focus on the future. And most times our focusing on the future is probably focusing on a very dismal state. Can't imagine that it can never be anything that was a joy or contentment in it. The same as the person who has lost a loved one, a spouse or parent or child. There's a time in the grief when you kind of feel, well, you know, I will never be happy again. But it does eventually break through, sometimes not usually as a great big discovery, you know, on a bright sunny morning and everything is wonderful again, probably breaks through as a little glimmer when someone says something such as, you know, well, I may as well make the best of a bad job, you know, that type of stuff. But there is that sense that there is a future and from there, start to engage, participate, build, connect, and a new future settles in to that new normal. So that's kind of a the progression that we go through, unbeknownst to ourselves really, in dealing with any grief, trauma, whatever words we're going to use for it. But a very significant, very significant uh, uh, um, component of how we grieve is our analysis of, I suppose we might say our analysis or what answer we put to the question of why did this happen? Beneath it is the question, we might describe it this way, was it avoidable or unavoidable? When something happens and we see it as something that could have been avoided, and should have been avoided, right. and would have been avoided, right. but wasn't avoided, that churns up a lot of strong negative feelings. Lack of decision. Pardon me? The lack of decision. Lack of decision, or lack of insight, or, lack of courage, or just, you know, trying to manage it in a way that just doesn't work. But that is, that analysis gives the shape to the grieving process or the grieving the grief journey. Then I see it as something that could have been avoided. And in this sequence of things that we're dealing with in these parishes and this diocese and the church in the province and the church in the nation and the church around the world, where we're seeing so much change in, in, in so many ways, well, it depends what lens you look through, whether you would see it as avoidable or unavoidable. Some would probably try to make the case that all of this was unavoidable. But most would say, looking back at it now, 
a lot of us more recently and more historically could have been and should have been avoided if things were done differently. And so we can roll it back to the point of saying, well, you know, maybe the law of celibacy, but well, that was brought in. That's was the beginnings of a problem. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. There's lots written and lots of commentary on, on that. But on more recent matters that are bringing about these things that are happening now, well, clearly by court analysis, legal processes, there are things that point clearly to where the mistakes were made and what should have been done, it wasn't done, or could have been done, it wasn't done. There lies the problem. But we do know that when something happens bad in anyone's life and they see it, they feel it in their own heart and soul that it is avoidable, it brings about entirely different feelings than if we see it as being unavoidable. In my brief counseling, I talked to many people who had losses under all kinds of circumstances. I remember one particular couple, her child was killed by a drunken driver right in front of her house. And when they went out, there were people gathered around and fell in the car. When the police arrived, they were taking him out and he was so drunk he couldn't stand up. That evening I was with them in the quiet room, as we used to call it, in the old Janeway. And uh, the intensive care physician came in and told them we were doing the brain, they would be doing the brain death protocol and those kinds of things. I remember that evening, the mother, she was so upset, she was so angry that her child was now brain dead. Uh, caused by a drunken driver. I remember the father, her husband saying, well, you know, it wasn't that, be something else. When your number comes up, your number comes up. And I remember him saying that even, well, if he wasn't struck by that person, it would have been by someone else, or he would have struck a hole in the road and be killed, or I remember him saying this, or something might have fallen off an airplane. You know, when your time is up, your time is up. What is the way it is? But she was very frustrated by what her husband was saying. As time went on, I would see them quite often. He held his position, she held hers. And I remember him saying to her, You know, if you'd look at it the way I do, you wouldn't be nearly as upset as, as you are. And he was right, except we can't look at things through someone else's eyes or mind or values or beliefs or what have you. Needless to say, eventually, for the benefit of both of them, they went their separate ways, which was another loss for both of them. They're both good people, fine people, but sad circumstances brought their relationship to an end. But right up to today, he would still say the same. He would say, and so sometimes people look at most peculiar things and think of them as unavoidable. Whereas many around them would say they are avoidable. But when we do see something as avoidable, it obviously lays the foundation for very strong negative feelings when the avoidable thing really matters to us. Last one is a simple point to make that typically we move through life when we're moving through life or reading a book or going on a journey or anything else, we go from the beginning to the middle to the end. When we're dealing with losses, we have to deal with an ending. We do our brief journey, which is the middle phase, and then we are ready for the new beginning. And I think this is where we are in the church today, in our diocese, and other places are struggling with the same things. Trying to figure out what is ending, but not everything is ending. We know that we're probably something bigger, something better, but what is it, and how do we allow those things which need to die, to die, to move through the grief that comes from that, and be ready for whatever will be our new beginning, we might say, or the emergence of a new normal. William James, a great thinker in the late 
19th, early 20th century. He was a philosopher, a psychologist, and a, a physician. In his areas of interest and knowledge and skill, the thing that interested him, mo him most is, why do people become who and what they are? How do we become, become who and what we are? And it, though it can't be found in any of his writing, he is given the, the, the credit for this kind of succinct statement. He says, you sow a thought and reap an action. You sow an action and you reap a habit. You sow a habit and you reap a character. You sow a character and you reap a destiny. He was saying, the way we think about something, makes all the difference because how we think about it will lead us to what we're going to do and when we continue to think in a particular way we will act in that way that follows our thought and if we continue to think and act that way it becomes a habit to behave to act to do that and if we persist with that habit, it kind of overflows into the other things in life. So that those same, that same way of thinking, those same values, the same priorities, forms our character. And that of course gives shape to our destiny. How content or how troubled we will be, how happy or how sad we will be, flows out of that pathway that we move through from our thoughts to our actions, to our habits, to our character, and it becomes our destiny. And that same flow is there, whether we have, are talking about positive thoughts that result in positive actions, habits, character, and destiny, or if we want our thoughts to flow in a negative channel, like a negative circuit, a way of thinking or negativity leads to negative action or inaction and habits and character and destiny. And I think this is some of the challenge that we have, maybe opportunity is a better word for it, in the church today is to decide how do we want to think about what we are into in our lives. How do we want it to, how do we want the, the things that we're involved with in the church and in the church community and in our own participation and involvement to flow through us in our actions, in our habits, in our character, in our destiny? Part of it is how we're going to think about these losses and a fellow by the name William Ward, a great writer in the area of grief and bereavement as well, he laid out what he called four major tasks of grieving. I've kind of revised them a little bit and uh, uh, added one to kind of fit the occasion, but I'm sure he would say, yes, they fit. But the first one is to accept the reality, the loss change or ending, to accept the reality. It was hard to avoid the reality. You have to be, you know, almost brain dead not to see the reality that's here in the endings that are happening. But part of that is to be able to acknowledge that these things are very real to us and that they are painful, painful to us and to others because of the immensity and the depth of the changes. And we have to adjust to the world without that which is gone. The church as it was, the church that most of us would have grown up in, is no more. And we have to accept that. And we see it laid out in front of us in many families when our children, grandchildren, are not part of the church in the ways that we were and that we have, would probably hope that they would be. But we have to accept that and adjust to that world because the church as it was isn't there and they can't and won't participate in it in a way that we probably still wish they could and would. 
to find an enduring connection with that which is gone in the midst of embarking on a new life. The church as it was has changed certainly immensely, but there's still substantial things that are there and that we must hold on to and that we must build on. And those are the things that must make the difference for the formation of our new normal, new experience of church and building the kingdom of God. And a rediscovering of meaning and purpose for the future. But part of the challenge is to be able to decide Bring it back to William, to, uh, to uh, William James' thoughts on our thoughts, our actions, and so on. To be able to sort of what actually can we do anything about? And that is a changing landscape for members of the church, because oftentimes, no matter what we would want to do, we weren't allowed to do it. Serenity prayer, we all know it. I was never a waste of time to, to repeat it. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Before we push on, I take go back to this slide to make a point that I think is worthwhile here. Because it talks about processing the pain. Processing the hurts that come from changes, the wounds that we have. And there's a kind of a cliche, you might say, but it has a lot of wisdom in it. And that is hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. When you're hurting for whatever reason, you cannot help but hurt others. And the people you're hurt might not be, or the person you're hurt might not be the one who caused you to hurt. It's kind of that non specific response, almost like stress. But when we are hurting, we cannot help but hurt others. And that's a very powerful fact at this time when people are truly hurting because of what is happening in the life of the church. A way of responding to it. They're talking about it, the way of talking about others and so on, can give rise to a lot of new hurts. And so for that reason, in the spirit of Christianity, in the spirit of, of building the kingdom of God, it's important, I think, and worthwhile for us to think of, you know, what am I doing with the hurt that this gives me? Because if I'm trying to harbor a hurt, well, it's like the tea bag in the cup again. It's only getting stronger and stronger. I have to be able to release it somehow or other, come to grips with it, and bring my mind, my heart, back in again, so the thought, reap in action, to be able to surrender to that hurt and somehow or other give it a new meaning. After we take a few moments to have a chat here and see if anyone has questions or comments, we won't take too long in this break. We'll move on to taking that apart for a few minutes and then we'll wrap up. But for now, as we did before, anyone in the room or anyone online with questions, comments, anything you want to uh, you want to contribute, uh, those who are on uh, here in the room, I'll repeat your comment or question, but I'll likely short it up from your own, but don't be shy about uh, saying what you uh, what you would like to say or formulating your question in your own way and those online as well we'll make sure that, uh, that we repeat them so they can be heard by those who are here but anyone question comment anything to pitch in there our situation right now Rick, those of us who have been blessed to keep our churches mm -hmm are also struggling to find a way to make those who are lost feel welcome yeah. and to become a part of another entity altogether. Yeah. I mean, they have been so 
in, in their own communities and so involved, it's mm -hmm. very difficult yeah. Yeah. Uh, to move into an established area. Yeah. yeah. So our struggle, yeah. Yeah. And, and we are blessed that we have yeah. our own parish yeah. left. Yeah. Our struggle is to make them feel that they are us. Yes. You know, and many people, I know many people, uh, you know, from churches that are closing, people I've had conversations with, people who've been in a few sessions that I've presented, what have you. And I hear many say, it will never be the same. And they are absolutely right. Because it shouldn't be the same. And it won't be the same for the Basilica or for St. Joseph's or St. Mary's or other places around that are St. Peter's and so on that are maintaining their own church. They can't be the same. That would be awful to make others feel that they are visitors or less, you know, second class citizens or whatever way we'd go about it. So people are right in that it won't be the same, just as those who've lost loved ones will say, Life will never be the same again. And they are right. But it doesn't mean that they will never be happy again, or never content, never find joy again. But there will be things different to this. And uh, in this uh, restructuring, it won't be the same, but it can be a new life, a new vitality, a new witness, and lots of wonderful things. But that is the reality of it. Thank you for, for mentioning that. And I think the reality for, you know, I hate to look at the, the building. To me, the community is important, you know? Yes. And we, people might say, was oh, you're holding on to the silica. But we're not. It's, not, it's totally changed. Yeah. It's not going to be our facility. It will be something we rent. But yeah. it's not the building, it's the community. Yeah. And our community, community, just like everyone's, is in a state of grief because of what is happening and what has happened in the church. Oh, yeah. So, in a sense, we're all in the same storm together. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we, we all have uh, a lot to grieve, but we all have a lot to give each other, I think, too. Well, know? that's true. And that's what I yeah. think that's what we have to remember. Right. Yeah. And, you know, as a member, say, of the Basilica community, that is the very foundation that yeah. we're trying to do yeah. to make whoever comes through the door yeah. feel welcome. Yeah. But, you know, we might be the person standing on the door. Yeah. But we don't own, we're just the community. That's right. Yeah. And we happen to be here. Yeah, and that's a such an important distinction, and I think will be a big lesson that's being learned from all of this. You know, coming back for those around lines, making the point that you know it isn't holding on to buildings that matters; it's holding on to a community, and really now, as you would say, reforming and refreshing what the community is as new people become part of it, and that is. Uh, that is the spirit of what the church is, the body of Christ, that it is the community. The building is part of it, and the buildings have been an important part of it. But a lot of wonderful things have happened within buildings, but the time is here now when we have to do it a bit differently. Any other comments, or is there anything online in the chat? Or anything in the chat? No. Uh, just looking at the second question on your slide, saying, you know, what might help during this time for us. Well, for me personally, I've decided to kind of take a little step back, look at the big picture, and not rush to make a decision, or do I go to this church, this mm. church, or this yeah. church? Yeah. But and I, going with the, you know, we still have a pandemic going on. Mm. I have to look at where do I go that I feel safe? Mm -hmm. Because having underlying health issues, I want to go somewhere where I can freely wear a mask without anybody saying anything, yeah. freely to be able to social distance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
then once I go around and say, okay, I'll try this church, this church, this church, and wherever I decide, and not a rash decision, mm. then that's where I will end up. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what a lot of people will do, which is uh, saying for those who are online that you take time to kind of step back a bit and size up, figure out where the right fit is for yourself. Yes. I suspect a lot will do that. The welcoming communities will make most biggest impact on those who are searching. And I think that's where a lot of good energy needs to be put is to make people who are at least going to give it one last try <laughs> to feel welcome to discover that there is potential for a new and fresh community. And, and, uh, but in the meantime, we have no man problem. No, no. Yeah. yeah. So what are they going to do then? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Well, I didn't hear that. He, he said, no we don't have problem. No priests. Yeah. Sure. sure. Well, you know, that's going to be one of the things I see someone online is going to have a comment and we'll come to it in a second. But maybe that's part of what's going to emerge in the new, the new normal, you know. Different uh, places are going with different formats that are not as reliant on clergy. Some people create communities for themselves, you know, home church and these kinds of things that, you know, it isn't about attending churches, but coming together to read the scriptures and reflect on what we do and what have you. That, uh, you know, all those who have left who have given up attending church on a regular basis haven't altogether given up on everything, and so they might find new and different ways. We don't have the sermons. No, well, that might be part of what they will find for themselves, what will give meaning in their type of community. But other denominations don't have sermons either. But I hear what you're saying, and I I agree that you know the. Roman Catholic Church, as it has been, has resources and ministries, but also the grace for sacraments. The grace is there to other means for others who don't as well. So, so I think people will find what will give them meaning, and maybe what they will begin with might bring them back into whatever experience of the Catholic Church that is offered to them in their local communities. I think people will be on journeys and everybody won't make the same journey, I can assure you that. So we need a short and long-term plan. Indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the uh, first message is the message that all people, everyone, absolutely everyone, is the love of child of God. That is less loved no less by God at any time than anyone else in any other phase of their life. That's the first message. And if that's proclaimed, then people can feel that no matter what they believe or what where they're attending and how they participate, that they are still a beloved child of God, that that will give growth to everything else. But whatever we put qualifiers on it, that it's where you attend or how much you contribute or those types of things, we start to put a filter on God's love. And that's kind of a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> Someone online has a, is going to have a question or comment, and we want to hear it. Steve, I think, is it? Yes. When voting comes, remember, provincial or federal, remember what members took a stand for the parishes. Were there any? Okay, I didn't hear, but uh, he said basically when, when it comes to time to vote, remember which provincial and federal members took a stand for the parishes. And he asked, Were there any? Yeah, or was I was too far away from the bus. I don't know if it has been uh, in the political realm or not. I, I don't know, you know. Yeah. yeah, okay, folks, we're just going to push on with a, a few more thoughts before we wrap up. Uh, so the first one I kind of want to bring us to is, uh, you know, I suppose you could ask the question, why do we do what we do? Back to the quote by William, uh, the, the William James, you sow a thought, you reap an action, you sow an action, you reap a habit, you sow an action, you reap a, ha a, a character, you sow a character, you reap a destiny. So what is it? What, what are the core thoughts 
that will give that shape to us individually and collectively as communities. Well, there are about 166 places that the kingdom of God is mentioned in scripture because that was why God became part of humanity to bring about the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, Jesus said, but you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So the first thing is the kingdom of God. And over and over in the parables and other teachings of Jesus, he referred to the kingdom. But if the 166 mentions of the kingdom of God in the New Testament, there's actually only one place where the kingdom of God is described. And that's in Romans 14, 17, where some of the St. Paul's companions were kind of worried about eating, uh, eating food that had been offered to the gods and this kind of stuff. And uh, St. Paul was telling them, listen, you know, don't be getting tied up about that kind of stuff. He said, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, justice in a lot of uh, translations, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is the place where there is fairness, where is justice, where we wouldn't be looking at less than 10% of the world's population controlling over 90% of the world's resources and over 90% of the world's population trying to get by on 10% of the world's resources, and even within that is not equally distributed. There's such starvation and, and, and drought and hurt and harm. And that 10% who have controlled so much wealth are developing so much pollution into the environment that that too is drifting into the water, into the air, into the environments of the underdeveloped countries and making their life worse. That's not the building of the kingdom of God. That's not about righteousness or fairness or justice. It's about peace, harmony, showing respect, love, kindness, reaching out to the vulnerable, the option for the poor. That's what the kingdom of God is about. And it comes about in, in, in wonderful ways. One time I was uh, downtown with a couple of young people and uh, we were walking around by one of Tim Horton's uh, outlets and uh, there was a fellow there, you know, wanted to ask him for money. So I uh, took out a Tony and I gave it to him and uh, I said, now you get yourself something to eat, you know, or let's don't go wasting this on something. Uh, and one of the young people was with me and he took out five dollars and he gave it to him. And I'm not sure if his words were intended for my ears or for the fellow he was giving it to, but they were certainly powerful to me because he handed him five dollars, he put it in his hand and he kind of squeezed his hand and he said, I'm giving this to you and you can do with it whatever you want. Mm -hmm. That is righteousness, peacemaking, and joy of the Holy Spirit. That's showing respect for a vulnerable person. That's allowing somebody to feel that they have dignity as a person, being putting no qualifications on. That is recognizing that we are all, regardless of what type of rags we're wrapped in, we are all beloved children of God and deserve the same respect. And that is the rootedness of the joy in the Holy Spirit. And that, I think, is what has to inspire us in this age and phase in the life of the church, is that our call and our summons is really one thing only, and that is to build the kingdom of God. That theme, the church has left the building, is probably a good reflection of getting out there to build the kingdom of God, getting out to the outreach ministries, and there are so many from these parishes that are involved in, in this immediate consolidation and other places throughout the archdiocese that have been doing great work towards the building of the kingdom of God and God's grace will allow it to continue. 
But we're in a painful phase of it now, and there's a kind of a, a theme I put to, to this, that we're in now to the phase of the healing of wounds and the wounds of healing. The word healing has been used very much in relation to the victims of abuse in the church and the residential school matters and other things. People always want healing. And several things are part of the healing process. One is uh, apologies, the other is compensation. But also, there are wounds of healing. That for those who are have been hurt, for those who've been wounded, for those who, who, who are in pain, sometimes to heal, you have to disturb that wound and feel the pain of it again in the retelling, in the acknowledging of the seriousness of it. Sometimes, in fact, some writers suggest that one of the unfortunate things we've done in Christianity is minimized forgiveness by kind of rather than acknowledging the severity of hurts and then apologizing or saying, I forgive you, we, we don't go to the depth of the hurt. We minimize it by saying, oh, well, it really doesn't matter. That was only me being childish or, you know, that was years ago. It doesn't matter any longer. But sometimes the true healing of the wounds requires a feeling of the pain, a refreshing of it. And we know, of course, that happens for the victims of all of these things because we see it in front of our own eyes, perhaps not as much in person to us as we see it in the media and through the court cases and those types of things. But there's another aspect to the wounds of healing as well. That is, and it illustrates that we are connected. We are, in fact, the body of Christ. And these are the wounds of healing that we're carrying today. The broken hearts, the sadness, the torment that you and I and so many of us are feeling because of all that is happening in our churches and our parishes and our dioceses and the church broader than, than the archdiocese, the church universal. These, in many cases, are, in fact, the wounds of healing. They're the price being paid. They're actually going, it's, it's, it's going arm in arm with Jesus in the redemptive suffering when we because we're part of the body of Christ because we're part of the communion of saints because we're part of a broader church whether it's in local context because we're part of something that is past and present and are about building for the future that we are occurring wounds now wounds of being broken financially, being broken as communities, being broken in credibility, being broken in reputation. These are the wounds of healing. And I think the, the reframing of what it's all about that perhaps allows us to have give it some value, give what we're going through some value, is to acknowledge that these have been deep and serious hurts. And they have caused deep wounds on others. And now we as church, the body of Christ, have to take our wounds with Christ for the redemption of the community, for the redemption of the building of the kingdom of God, the redemptive actions that must be taken for the building of the kingdom of God. So I think when we look at it that way, you know, it might give, make some sense to us. Just as in our own lives, whether we're talking about physical wounds or emotional wounds or relationship wounds and so on, when things happen, we know that to get past them, there are usually new wounds that are going to be exposed one way or another, and they too have to be dealt with. And that's exactly where we are now in the life of the church. And I hope that kind of taking that kind of theological or spiritual gaze upon it 
might allow us to make a bit of sense of it. And, you know, come to think of it, this whole business of all the abuse and that they went down, it was too big and too serious to be able to just kind of skate on past as, as if it never happened. Too much damage was done. That wouldn't be about justice or righteousness or peace or bringing about the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so for it to happen, we are dealing with the woundedness that has been laid upon us. I think, you know, one of the things that can give us a bit of refreshment as well is to realize that for many who probably or definitely don't participate in the church as they did in the past, can't help but notice that. But they aren't abandoned by God. And in many ways, most people have not abandoned God either, even unbeknownst to themselves. Because God is present to us. Jesus is present to us in a multiplicity of ways. And on the bottom, not to say that it's last or least is our regard for the Eucharist and sacraments, such an important component in the life of the church and in the way that we, we gather as community and, and, and build the kingdom of God. But the other way is that God is present was in creation. We have several passages in scripture that Oh, several, many passages, one is in Romans as well as the one in Colossians and John, but all pointing to the fact, as it says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. St. Paul said, of course, the first, uh, uh, the word is also an essential way that Christ is present to us, and that would be in John, in the first part of the uh, of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was created in Him, and through Him, for Him. All that is came to be through the Word. And then the Word that we have in Scripture is the effective communicator of God's will, God's mind, God's teaching, God is truly present to us when we take the word, when we listen to it, when we, when we ponder it, we meditate on it, when we talk about it, in the churches and the revised lectionaries and the re revised design of churches following guidance from the Second Vatican Council. There are two tables in the sanctuary of any church, table of the word, where Christ is present in the proclamation, and the table of the Eucharist, where Christ is present in uh, under the forms of the bread and wine. So it's the word, I missed on that slide, creation. Christ is present to us, cheek to jaw, in acts of mercy. And that's there in many places as well, where Jesus illustrated in his stories and in his own examples, in his healings, in his parables, but also Clearly in Matthew 25, when the fellow said, when did I see you hungry? When did I see you in prison? When did I see you sick? And so on. And Jesus said, whenever, whatsoever you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. So Christ is present. We are present to Christ. He is present to us. We encounter Christ in the service, in ministry to the poor, to the neglected, to the vulnerable. Again, we encounter Christ in community. When two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. And in prayer, in quiet prayer, assembled prayer, formal prayer, contemplation, any forms of prayer, we communicate with God. God speaks to us in the silence. If we allow ourselves to listen, we will hear God. And God hears us. When we communicate. So, so many people who don't attend still have their own ways of being in the real presence of God. It isn't only those who are attending church. And I think that's what people are 
working with today is how do they connect with God? How is Jesus relevant? Where do they do it? A way of thinking of it, I think, but maybe makes sense, at least to me. You can imagine that each of those ways, the word, creation, mercy, community, prayer, Eucharist, sacrament, each would be like the strand of a rope. Each is strong and each makes us connection. As we wind two or three or four or five, six or more together, become stronger, a stronger connection. And I think as people start to participate in one type or another, one way or another, of connecting with the Lord, they will be drawn to connect in other ways as well. And that I think is where and how we can find how are all these young people who don't have anything to do with the building of the church because it represents a many things that they see and have experienced as betrayal. And sometimes it isn't betrayal to themselves because they've never had a connection, but they see how their parents and even grandparents were betrayed by those things that have come about. But I think we appreciate that these are the promises that God has given us, of how God is present with us. And we can trust that all of those younger people and older people as well, who are drifting away from the traditional practice and life of the church, are not drifting away from the church at all. It's just they're going to do it in a bit of a different way, maybe for a little while, maybe for a long while. But it's all God's work. Folks, just before we wrap up, I'm just going to see if anyone has a, a quick question or comment or observation. Anyone online wish to have a, something in the chat or a raised hand? I just left something in the chat because I guess it's kind of hard to hear. Yeah, just... Uh... Steve was mentioning that you know the Ukrainian people had their churches and houses building taken away by evil forces represented by Russians, uh, but are fighting them back. Here in Canada, we had our churches taken away by evil forces represented by judges and lawyers. What do we do to take them back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is it the buildings that have to be taken back, or is it the spirit and the buildings will come about in whatever form in their own time and place? But for sure. We can look at other places in the world, I wish you're mentioning, Steve, and see that resilience is so important. Other comments from anyone? Well, folks, if not, I'll just push on one last little thought, and it's not mine, it's really from a, a, a great poet by the name of uh, John Oxenham. But it speaks to the fact that, you know, when we're talking about these kinds of matters, we can talk about them in generalities, and I'll throw some stuff at you that's from theoretical uh, sources on brief, from the academics, and some practical things worth considering that makes it applicable to this uh, context. But when all is said and done, everyone will do it in their own way. And uh, John Oxenham had a, a grasp on that in the uh, late 19th century, and he was the uh, kind of context of sailing, which makes sense to me, I like to say. He says, one ship sails east and another west while the self-same breeze does blow. It's the set of the sail and not the gale that bids them where to go. So it is, as we journey on for life, it's the set of the soul that marks the goal and not the storms and the strength. And that's kind of how it is. We certainly have lots of storm and strife and disturbance on us at this time. But figuring out how do I set my soul? And then I'll connect with others who are setting off in generally the same direction. And we'll probably keep touch with each other and build community from there. Anything from anyone? I would like for history, because history goes back to this. 
to say that we were a resilient people and we did succeed and we came together. I would go to the history. So we can only do that if we, as you say, work together. Indeed, yes, yeah, yeah, and I like the point, you know, history will will show what the likely church was in our province and well around the world, and these blights that have come upon us will be uh, part of that, but the survival from it will hopefully show that there is something stronger and deeper and more genuine, and that even these worst things can be can be overcome, for sure. Thanks for joining us. So, folks, if that's it, good night. Uh, nice being here. Thank you. Before we conclude, I'd like to, uh, um, okay. I'll, you can, I'll say a quick thank you to uh, Rick, my yeah. brother, and remind uh, just uh, the, uh, how we could talk about the busy schedule of being here. He'll be at the OR most of our hour, I think, sir. Yes. All of yeah. us, that to Rick. <laughs> um, on behalf of the facility, we certainly want to thank you. And I'm sure thank everybody for coming as well. And we, I think we all have to realize that there's something that we are, we are all here because we want to make this succeed. That's right. And you know, we have to work together. And thank you. I think right. all of us tonight will you'll help us work through our group. Right, right. And we also want to thank, thank Ryan Hayward here, who yes, right. Ryan, thank thank you. Uh, for helping us with the technology. So right, will there be a follow-up meeting? That's uh, up to others. <laughs> I'm a, a guest. Uh, yes, will there be a follow-up meeting? And good night to those who are online. Thank you. Thank you.